Uh oh, this is just some YouTube infotainment guy. He doesn't understand Peterson, he doesn't understand Marx. Burns just doesn't get Peterson. He thought that what he thought was correct, and he never went the second stage, which is, how could all of this go terribly wrong? This is the final nail in the coffin. Dr. Burns gave a misleading impression of Marx. You ever watch something and it just rubs you the wrong way? That's how I felt when I watched a recent video by Wisecrack, where host Michael Burns broke down Jordan Peterson's take on Marx, given in a friendly debate against Slavov Zizek. I'd watched the original debate shortly after its upload to YouTube, so I was familiar with the source content already. My reaction to the Wisecrack video can be put into three categories. At first, I was impressed by the host's ostensibly charitable framing of Peterson's work. Then I began to suspect that the host didn't quite understand Peterson's argument. Later on, I began to vehemently disagree with the host's take on Marx. I thought, oh, this is just some YouTube infotainment guy with no real philosophical chops. He doesn't understand Peterson, he doesn't understand Marx. One more thing I forgot to say before you get into this video. If you haven't seen the debate between Peterson and Slavov, watch that. If you haven't seen the video from Wisecrack, watch that. Uh, although I do try to include as much as is necessary for this video. So in what I hope is at least a C minus effort, I'm going to attempt to respond to Dr. Burns' takes. In this response, I'll attempt to prove that Dr. Burns is wrong about what Jordan Peterson believes and that Burns' portrayal of Marx is misleading. What struck me about the Communist Manifesto was it was akin to something Jung said about typical thinking, and this was the thinking of people who weren't trained to think. He said that the typical thinker has a thought, it appears to them like an object might appear in a room, the thought appears, and then they just, they just accept it as true. They don't go the second step, which is to think about the thinking. And that's the real essence of critical thinking. Okay, so I find this really interesting because Peterson is implying that Marx, and in this case Engels, did not take their, their whole arsenal to the critique they're offering in this text. And this is a point where it seems like Peterson and Karl have a lot more in common than they realize. You could argue that Marx, in most of his work, is doing precisely what Peterson's talking about, right? Marx is analyzing the logic of industrial capitalism, which is assumed, or was assumed at the time, to be a good and logical system, and he's looking for internal contradictions and antagonisms within that system. When Peterson says, that you need to use everything in your arsenal to see if an idea can survive. It seems like he's describing what Marx is doing, and Marx called this ruthless criticism, or in one text, the ruthless criticism of everything existing. Now here's Marx, and this is from a letter he wrote in 1843. Marx says, now philosophy has become mundane, and the most striking proof of this is that philosophical consciousness itself has been drawn into the torment of the struggle, not only externally, but also internally. But if constructing the future and settling everything for all times are not our affair, it is all the more clear what we have to accomplish at present. I am referring to ruthless criticism of all that exists. Ruthless both in the sense of not being afraid of the results it arrives at and in the sense of being just as little afraid of conflict with the powers that be. I don't know, I just find that interesting that Peterson is describing something similar to what Marx is doing and one could argue that Marx is doing that in the text at hand. That seems plausible in some ways. But what was Peterson's claim here? I think if you look at the seconds preceding the ones that Burns showed, there's a very different picture on display. I have some things to say about the authors psychologically. The first thing is that it doesn't seem to me that either Marx or Engels grappled with one fundamental, with this particular fundamental truth, which is that um, almost all ideas are wrong. And so if you and it doesn't matter if they're your ideas or someone else's ideas. Peterson seems to be accusing Marx of not applying a critical eye to Marx's own ideas, his own insights. Peterson is calling Marx an academic version of basic for not appearing to give his own ideas an ounce of scrutiny. From this, it seems like Dr. Burns has misinterpreted Peterson. So I find this interesting because when he says, you know, people, and it seems to be implied here that Marx doesn't go a second step to think about thinking. Well, like Marx came up 
studying and eventually critiquing the philosophical work of Hegel, a 19th century German idealist. Now, Hegel and the German idealist tradition was focused on precisely this, right? Thinking about thinking, or maybe put differently, thinking about the possibility of the conditions of thinking. Idealist philosophy could be summed up as maybe the most detailed thinking about thinking in the history of philosophy. And Marx was well aware of this tradition. He studied it. Um, it was included in his PhD dissertation. He wrote a book on Hegel. And Marx then turns this logical system on its head by taking the method that the idealist used to think about thinking and using it to think about history and materiality and politics. It's, it's said that Marx, you know, turns Hegel on his head by making that mode of thinking about reality and not ideas. Exactly. For Marx, it's not about his own ideas. It's about economics and history and the views that others have on those topics. Dr. Burns counters that Marx thinks about thinking all the time, but is that what Peterson means when he talks about thinking? With the prior context that Dr. Burns omitted, it doesn't seem like Peterson is concerned about talking about philosophical projects like idealism, monism, dualism, or any metaphysical idea of any kind. It also doesn't seem like Peterson is criticizing Marx for ignoring the internal logic of historical or economic thinking. Peterson, I think, is approaching this almost entirely within the domain of psychology and from a psychological framework. I have some things to say about the authors psychologically. I have some things to say about the authors psychologically. I have some things to say about the authors psychologically. Peterson is talking about criticizing one's own thoughts, not the makeup of the universe or the logical preconditions for thinking. Peterson notes the psychological tendency to be overly confident in one's own insights, to not reflect or scrutinize on those appearances. So when Marx comments on what he thinks are the preconditions for economics or history, how rigorously does he probe the veracity of his own insights? I just wish Dr. Burns gave us a snippet of the manifesto or any of Marx's other writings where Marx was criticizing his own ideas. Anyway, I think my read of Peterson's thinking about thinking being based in psychology rather than philosophy is more justified than Dr. Burns' opposite take, especially given this lovely little snippet. But what he thought, what he thought when he thought was that what he thought was correct. And he never went the second stage, which is, well, wait a second, how could all of this go terribly wrong. Okay, so Peterson's critical of the idea that he's reading the Communist Manifesto is making a claim that for Marx, history is primarily viewed as an economic and class struggle. And there's definitely truth to that. You know, what Marx is doing is, is reading history dialectically. Now here's what Marx says himself in the manifesto, or Marx and Engels say themselves. The history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. But on the word society, there's actually a footnote in the text. And in the footnote, they say, that is all written history. So, you know, the full line is, the history of all written society is the history of class struggle. So, you know, Marx is specifying that he's talking about written history, largely European history. They also go on to say this in the manifesto. In the earlier epochs of history, we find almost everywhere a complicated arrangement of society into various orders, a manifold gradation of social rank. In ancient Rome, we have patricians, knights, plebeians, slaves. In the Middle Ages, feudal lords, vassals, guildmasters, journeymen, apprentices, serfs. In almost all of these classes, again, subordinate gradations. So in that quote, we see that Marx and Engels, while reading history, as the history of class struggle and antagonism are not always just breaking it down to binary oppositions, they seem to understand the complexity of those relations. This is another instance where I think Dr. Burns misunderstands Peterson because when he describes Marx's ideas here, they don't seem to fully respond to what Peterson is saying. There's a sense here where Peterson is making a quasi-intersectional argument by talking about the multitude of ways in which people can struggle. Dr. Burns' response is pretty unsatisfying in that it seems to say, sure, Marx knew that sometimes there were more than two classes. Sometimes there were 
lots of classes and lots of different strata for there to be struggle between. Forget ethnic cleansing, cultural clashes, religious programs, they don't matter. Nationalism doesn't matter. It's the economy, stupid. Okay, so here Peterson is criticizing the manifesto for presumably saying that all human history is the history of struggle and that that struggle and class struggle is inherently tied to capitalism. Now, Peterson is noting that struggle and, and human hierarchy, of course, pre-exists capitalism. And he's totally right. And I don't think that Marx would disagree with him at all. Now, Marx has a dialectical reading of history in which history is marked by struggle and antagonism, but it's not that capitalism is the driving force of that. It's that capitalism, when he is writing, is the most advanced stage of that historical development. Um, let's see what Marx has to say himself. This is from the German ideology, and Marx says, the first premise of all human history is, of course, the existence of living human individuals. Thus, the first fact to be established is the physical organization of these individuals and their consequent relation to the rest of nature. Man can be distinguished from animals by consciousness, by religion, or anything else you like. They themselves begin to distinguish themselves from animals as soon as they begin to produce their means of subsistence, a step which is conditioned by their physical organization. By producing their means of subsistence, men are indirectly producing their actual material life. So here, Marx is grounding human struggle in the particularity of humans producing their own means of subsistence. So before capitalism or any other economic system, there is this fundamental relationship between humans and nature. And this relationship and the struggle implicit in it is the foundation of human consciousness and society. And Marx never implies that this struggle doesn't pre-exist capitalism. Peterson seems to be arguing that struggle is the result of inequality that arises from hierarchy itself. And when Peterson calls it fundamental, this refers to context immediately prior to what the Wisecrack video showed. History this is to give the devil his due. The idea that one of the driving forces between history is hierarchical struggle is absolutely true. But the idea that that's actually history is not true because it's deeper than history. It's biology itself because organisms of all sorts organize themselves into hierarchies. And one of the problems with hierarchies is that they tend to arrange themselves into a winner-take-all situation. And so, and that, that is implicit in some sense in Marx, Marx's thinking, because of course Marx believed that in a capitalist society, capital would accumulate in the hands of fewer and fewer people. And that actually is in keeping with the nature of hierarchical organizations. Now, the problem with that isn't so much the fact of... The, so there's, the, there's accuracy in the accusation that that is an eternal form of motivation for struggle, but it's an underestimation of the seriousness of the problem because it attributes it to the structure of human societies rather than the deeper reality of the existence of hierarchical structures per se, which as they also characterize the animal kingdom to a large degree, are clearly not only human constructions. And the idea that there's hierarchical competition among human beings there's evidence for that that goes back at least to the Paleolithic times. This is what I'll call Peterson's hierarchy thesis. Hierarchy creates inequality itself, which is the root cause of class struggle. Peterson calls this the more sophisticated take on class struggle. Is it true that Marx recognizes the scope of the problem that Peterson is pointing to. Now, Peterson is noting that struggle and, and human hierarchy, of course, pre-exists capitalism. And he's totally right. And I don't think that Marx would disagree with him at all. Dr. Burns acts like Jordan Peterson is saying what Marx is saying, using different words, and is just unaware of this fact. Dr. Burns is actually giving Marx too much credit according to the very text that Dr. Burns himself referenced. The history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. But on the word society, there's actually a footnote in the text. And in the footnote, they say, that is all written history. Let's have a closer look at that footnote. 
That is, all written history. In 1847, the prehistory of society, the social organization existing previous to recorded history, was all but unknown. Since then, August von Haxthausen discovered common ownership of land in Russia. George Ludwig von Moyer proved it to be the social foundation from which all Teutonic races started in history, and, by and by, village communities were found to be, or to have been, the primitive form of society everywhere from India to Ireland. The inner organization of this primitive, communistic society was laid bare in its typical form by Lewis Henry Morgan's crowning discovery of the true nature of the gens and its relation to the tribe. With the dissolution of the primeval communities, society begins to be differentiated into separate and finally antagonistic classes. So it seems like Marx actually thought pre-written history in early human societies. Society was communistic and there was no oppression similar to that kind that produces class struggle. Now Peterson, of course, could be totally wrong about that claim and maybe struggle started with written history. Clearly, Peterson's hierarchy thesis is different from the one noted by Marx in the Communist Manifesto. This is an instance of Dr. Burns misreading Peterson. Right here, Peterson is accusing Marx of not thinking about or acknowledging nature or not, not even acknowledging the existence of nature. He's accusing Marx of not acknowledging that a primary struggle for humanity is the struggle with nature. But Marx does that. Um, so I'm gonna let Marx talk for a second. Here's Marx from the Paris Manuscripts. Nature is man's inorganic body, that is to say, nature insofar as it is not the human body. Man lives from nature, and he must maintain a continuing dialogue with it if he is not to die. To say that man's physical and mental life is linked to nature simply means that nature is linked to itself, for man is a part of nature. So right here, he's noting that that contradiction between man and nature is fundamental to human existence. And this is Marx describing the fundamental antagonisms that drive human consciousness and history. Everything Peterson says he doesn't do, he's doing. Let's let Marx talk some more. This is Marx from Capital Volume 1. He says, Labor is, in the first place, a process in which both man and nature participate, and in which man, of his own accord, starts, regulates, and controls the material reactions between himself and nature. He opposes himself to nature as one of her own forces, setting in motion arms and legs, heads and hands, the natural forces of his body, in order to appropriate nature's productions in a form adapted to his own wants. By thus acting on the external world and changing it, he at the same time changes his own nature. So again, this is Marx describing the interaction between humans and nature as fundamental to the process of labor, fundamental to history, and fundamental to developing our own humanity. So everything that Jordan says he didn't do, he's doing. It okay, on this one I half agree, or one out of three, I third agree. When it comes to the question of nature's infliction of privation, Dr. Burns is right, Peterson biffs it. Let's call that a W for Marxism and an L for Peterson's reading of it. I think had Peterson kept the scope of his claim restricted to the manifesto, it may have been more plausibly sustained. The reason Dr. Burns is only one third right, in my humble opinion, stems from the two additional struggles that Peterson mentions, but go unaddressed by Marx, at least in terms of the evidence and comments that Dr. Burns gives us. The first of those, the hierarchy thesis, I think I've already established goes unaddressed in the Communist Manifesto. The second, psychological and internal mental struggle, I'm somewhat agnostic on. I would be unsurprised if Marx spent very little time thinking and writing on this topic, and I'm equally unsurprised that Peterson does quite the opposite. They are polar opposites in their spheres of interest. If we were talking economics, Marx would be a macroeconomics professor and Peterson would gravitate towards microeconomics or perhaps behavioral economics. Peterson by training and occupation is a psychologist. And so understanding at the level of the individual is precisely what occupies his mind. Marx, on the other hand, saw individuality and autonomy as alienating, as fool's bargains. 
illusory and attractive mirages. Marx was barely alive for the earliest stages of experimental psychology, but he was harsh critics of individualist philosophers like Max Stirner and Pierre-Joseph Proudhon. His focus was on systems, perhaps even to the exclusion of those systems' components' parts. Whether this would have carried over into a focus on sociology to the exclusion of psychology is at least debatable, but probably true. The individual's internal psychology never seems remarked on by Marx in the Communist Manifesto. Okay, friends, um, this simply isn't true what he's saying here, and I think it's kind of dangerous when he makes this claim. Um, in his entire career, Karl Marx was fairly consistent about not advocating for revolutionary violence. Now, to be clear, Marx didn't make that argument on moral grounds. He thought that violence could be strategically problematic. Now, to give the final word here to Marx and Engels, here's how they describe revolution in the Communist Manifesto. In short, the communists everywhere support every revolutionary movement against the existing social and political order of things. In all these movements, they bring to the front as the leading question in each the property question, no matter what its degree of development at the time. Finally, they labor everywhere for the union and agreement of the democratic parties of all countries. And I think that last line is really important. They labor everywhere for the union and agreement of the democratic parties of all countries. And that's something you see in the manifesto, their call for communists to work with democratic parties and parties in all countries that support their aims. Um, it is not a text that calls for violent revolution. I know this because I opened up my PDF of it. I typed control F. I typed in the word violence. I clicked return and nothing came up. So in case you thought I didn't do my research, I did. This was the initial match that lit my fuse. I was triggered so, so badly. Turns out that was a slight overreaction, but not by much. This just seemed like straight up sanitizing Marx. There's a distinction between early Marx and late Marx in terms of rhetoric that, oddly enough, scholars regard as clearly evident between the German ideology and Kapital. Relevantly, this distinction or change in attitudes is true of how Marx understood revolution. Before we go there though, Dr. Burns calls Peterson a instigator of dangerous actions through his rhetoric. I guess if Peterson was as wrong as Dr. Burns said, that would be appropriate. I would even get on board and condemn Peterson for using these statements to formulate his own brand of dangerous identity politics by labeling an outgroup as a threat. The problem is, I think Dr. Burns is way off when it comes to Marx's supposedly dovish take. So when Dr. Burns says that Marx was relatively consistent on the topic of revolution through violence, I think he means that there were only fleeting moments where Marx thought it was a good idea or that it was sparingly appropriate as a means of effecting revolution. While Marx seemingly got softer in his old age, in his early years, Marx thought that violent revolution was going to be necessary everywhere in Europe except for England. A Polish Marxist scholar and philosopher, an active member of the Polish Marxist party throughout the Cold War characterized the exact manifesto quote Dr. Burns left us with in the following way. This by now classic formulation includes two statements. One, the existing social and political system is to be changed by a revolution. And two, that a social revolution is to be identified with an overthrow of the existing social system by violence. Mr. Schaff goes on to critique this interpretation as fallacious, but only in terms of degree, not absolutely. He goes on to remark that the Communist Manifesto, in particular, sanctioned violent revolution. Even in his more peaceful golden years, according to Schaff, Marx only exempted three countries as places where the revolution could be bloodless. That would be England, the United States, and possibly the Netherlands. It's notable that Marx was actually exiled to England in his later years and may have been trying to avoid getting censored or kicked out of the country uh, by moderating his typical message of violent revolution. In one of his early works, Marx said that the weapon of criticism cannot replace criticism with weapons. Pretty badass, not gonna lie. So did Marx support violent revolution? 
Not in every case, but it seems like in most places, most of the time throughout Marx's life, he did think it was necessary, at least by the account of one Marxist philosopher. I think Dr. Burns is being cheeky about how he did his control F homework on the manifesto's violent contact, but I wish he gave us more about how he reached his position. I think this is the final nail in the coffin, showing that Dr. Burns gave a misleading depiction of Marx. So what do you, the viewer, think? Did I get this right? Did Dr. Burns? Did Peterson? Did Slavov Zizek? I haven't even talked about him. And if you're Dr. Burns viewing this, did I at least get a C minus? Actually, if you're Dr. Burns, are there any openings of Wisecrack? I'll take an unpaid internship, janitor, whatever you got. I could do the goodwill hunting thing and solve stuff in the middle of the night. For those of you who made it this far, thank you. I really appreciate the time that you invested in watching this video. I put a lot of time and effort into researching and putting this video together. Uh, and I, I can't say enough how grateful I am. Also, if you think that a video analyzing and criticizing Peterson in this debate would be something you'd be interested in, let me know. See you in a couple years.